Hi, I'm Femi OK. You're watching the stream Home Edition. Globally, New Zealand is getting a lot of respect for the way it has handled the COVID pandemic. Last month, New Zealanders rewarded Jacinda Ardern's Labour Party with a landslide election result. But inside New Zealand, child advocates are pointing out that Ardern, who made eradicating child poverty one of her key missions, still has a very long way to go. Tēnā koutou katoa. Aotearoa New Zealand has just over a million children. 70% of them live well, but 20% dip in and out of disadvantage, while 10% live in chronic poverty. Indigenous Māori children and their families are impacted the most, a legacy of colonisation that structurally and systemically generates suffering for Māori. COVID-19 showed us just how quickly our nation can move to address unacceptable risk and shone a bright light on the widening gap between the rich and the poor in this country. In a well-resourced nation like New Zealand, which prides itself on kindness, it's unacceptable to have so many people struggling. Urgent action is needed to ensure the burden of a worldwide recession doesn't deepen and widen poverty in this country. This is a challenge particularly for all nations where Indigenous children experience disproportionate and chronic disadvantage. Why so many children in New Zealand are being left behind is our discussion today. If you're on YouTube, jump into the comment section and be part of our discussion. Let me say hello to the guests. The guests will introduce themselves to you. Hello, Boris. Tell the world who you are. Hi, I'm... Uh... I guess I'm uniquely placed to comment on this conversation. I'm a, a Bulgarian Maori, which means I'm of indigenous um, descent. My wife's mm -hmm. also from Chile. So I have, a, a, I guess, a wider world um, a view of, of the topic. And I also grew up uh, in what society would call a slum and have moved on to own several businesses. And I produce a, a radio show in New Zealand called The Nutters Club, which deals with uh, mental health issues. Nice to have you, Boris. Hello, Brooke. Tell everybody who you are. Uh, kia ora koutou katoa, whakalofalahi atu, uh, talofalava. My name's Brooke Stanley Powell, and I'm the coordinator with Auckland Action Against Poverty. We're a voluntary and political advocacy group um, that's fighting for a new system to ensure that everybody here can live a life with dignity. So thank Good you for having us you. on the show. Oh, you're so very welcome. And Lara, welcome. Tell everyone who you are. Kia ora, I'm Lara Greaves, Dr Lara Greaves. I'm a lecturer in New Zealand politics and public policy at the University of Auckland where I teach and research on um, Māori and New Zealand politics um, topics and issues. I'm Māori descent myself and um, I also am the Associate Director of the Public Policy Institute. So yeah, really happy to be here today and keen to get into these issues. Great to have you. Guess one of the reasons why we're, we're doing this show is that we looked at this UNICEF report back here on my laptop, Child Poverty in Perspective, an overview of child well-being in rich countries. New Zealand was one of the rich countries was, which wasn't doing well as far as child poverty is concerned. Laura, can you explain what happens in New Zealand that is so wealthy, doing so well in so many areas, but falling behind as far as child poverty is concerned? Okay, so we've had a long history of inequality leading back to the founding document of Aotearoa or one of the founding documents, the Treaty of Waitangi in 1840. And since then, um, we've just never had true partnership and equality between Indigenous Māori and Pākehā, which is what we refer to as the New Zealand European um, descent population. And um, adding to that over the years, we've had a lot of our sort of like Pacific cousins um, migrate to New Zealand and they also have had faced a lot of challenges um, coming up, up against institutional racism, structural inequality. We had a period in the 1980s of just like a huge amount of neoliberalism that kind of eroded our welfare state, which was quite world leading, um, heading back to sort of the 1930s. And and that we had cuts to benefit levels sort of in the 1990s and since then they've like they've just never been sufficient and that's where we're sitting that we're sitting in a place where we've had mm. growing inequality since the 1980s 1990s and it's not getting better and of course as you've outlined we now have the challenges of covid and that's just mm. kind of the current situation in new zealand is this growing inequality and this poverty for a lot of um, especially maori and pacific people brooke i can see you nodding as lara was talking articulate your nod mm. Oh, no, I'm just 
nodding in agreement. Um, as I mentioned before, we, we work with people uh, on the ground, on the front line who are experiencing poverty. Um, so we also advocate for people within our system to ensure that they receive the full support from um, our Ministry of Social Development. Um, we get families, people in uh, every day who are struggling to live day to day in this country. Um, and yeah, I was just nodding to Totoko uh, um, support what Laura yeah. was saying. Well, can, you, can you give us an example? Obviously, I don't want you to mention family names, etc. But we have to be able to leave it from the 20% or the 10% of kids are impacted in this way or 10% of families are impacted in this way. What does that mean in reality? Tell us a story that helps us understand that. Yeah, so we get solo parents coming in all the time. Um, you know, after all of their bills have been paid, they've only got $60 for the week. Um, we had a solo mum come in with four children the other day who, who was in that position. We've had solo dads come in. Um, a solo dad came in with his children needing to find more permanent accommodation. He's in, he's in emergency shelter at the moment um, because his children are ill um, and they need, you know, a better house, better, more secure housing to live in. Um, this is very normal for us here on the ground. Um, and yeah, it's devastating. Um, and we shouldn't, in a country like Aotearoa, New Zealand, we shouldn't have, mm. um, yeah, the material, people shouldn't be living in um, such hard circumstances that they are. Um, it's a real struggle. So so we got in contact with the Ministry for Children in New Zealand, and this is what Kelvin Davis sent us. It was a very long statement, but first of all, they were very keen to point out that over 18,000 children had been lifted out of poverty. And this is in the three years of this particular coalition government uh, being in power. Boris, should this be something to be celebrated or is there still so much further to go that, that uh, Jacinda Ardern's uh, declaration, I want to eradicate child poverty, was that just too ambitious? Well, f first off, you know, when it comes to t statistics, I'm a great believer in, you know, lies, damn lies and statistics. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I have a saying which is, don't confuse me with the facts, my mind's made up. So, you know, the, the, the numbers may say one thing, but uh, in, in terms of the, the, rea the reality, uh, one person uh, and one government isn't going to be able to affect the, the positive attitude and societal change we want in a short period of time. So I, I, I don't really feel that uh, that step means a great deal. I mean, last week I was talking to a, to a young lady who was... Um, uh, Grew up, grew up in in poverty. Her mother used to um, make a push a, a, a supermarket trolley around the supermarket, filling it with uh, with food, and then um, walk out of the supermarket without paying for it. Now she didn't want to do that, uh, and but if she didn't, her mother would give her a beating. You know, so you know these things are these things are happening and these things are real. But I do think that it's uh, a, a tad unfair to criticise the. Um, the the, uh, the the government and and the, and the prime minister um, for not making change fast enough. It's it's really something the bureaucrats have to have to do, and the bureaucrats are, are often faceless, so you don't see who they are. The politicians are just the people um, that you identify uh, very easily, so they're they're easy to take pot shots at. I think I think also though the government have a responsibility to ensure that. Um, People don't, I mean, they, they're the ones that make the laws. Jacinda Ardern and the Labour government have already been in, in power for one term. Um, and she's saying that even the next term, she's not looking at lifting current um, benefit levels to livable levels. So I think it is important that we remain critical of mm. the government to ensure that people on the ground are centred, that our children are centred and decisions that... Um, actually impact and affect them. These yeah. laws that yeah. politicians are making, they, the decisions of, about um, poverty in Aotearoa don't affect them. 
these decisions don't impact them. And so Can this is a, yeah. Yeah, go, go ahead, Laura. Huge concern for us because right now we've got a very popular Prime Minister, like one of the most popular of all time, won this huge majority which we would not expect under MMP, under our mixed member proportional electoral system. So basically at the moment, Jacinda Ardern and Labour have like a huge mandate to make transformational policy change. And so for a lot of us in Aotearoa, we're watching them and we're going, okay, are you going to try to be a centrist government and hold on to power for as long as possible by sitting in the middle and trying to appeal to middle New Zealand who might own a home, who might be sort of middle class, or are you going to try to do something that's transformational and shifts the paradigm and isn't just tinkering around the edges that actually tries to create some kind of structural change, structural change for Māori, structural change for these children, structural change in terms of inequality. And I think for a lot of us now, we're watching to see which direction they go in. And that's kind of quite important for, again, us to be that sort of voice to go, hey, what are you guys going to do now? Mm -hmm. Let me add an, another issue to, to the challenges you already have in New Zealand, although you seem to be far ahead than the rest of the world as far as uh, managing the COVID pandemic. This is Catherine and Catherine is a teacher and she talks about what COVID has done to the existing poverty in New Zealand. Let's have a listen. For young people living on or below the poverty line, issues have definitely gotten considerably worse since COVID-19 hit New Zealand. Young people have become really big contributors to the household or sole breadwinners as a result of supporting families where there have been redundancies or job losses or people with compromised health who were unable to work during the worst periods and all of that has kind of compiled and made things a lot worse for young people and they have a lot more on their shoulders and have as a result had to grow up a little bit faster in this time. Mm -hmm. So the priorities of the Adern government, just as they've been re-elected, are uh, restoring business and the economy after COVID and also just managing COVID. Um, child poverty, poverty was not high up there on the list, despite people reminding Adern that that was one of her key missions. Uh, Boris, pick up off the back of that, the additional impact of COVID. How have you seen that? Well, you know, the... <laughs> I'm a business owner and I'm involved in several different sectors, right? I'm also involved in social causes, so I get to see life at both the top and the bottom ends of town. Uh, the first thing I'd say, let's be clear, if the government hadn't provided a wage subsidy to employers, consider considerably more people at the uh, bottom end of town would have become unemployed a lot quicker. Um, and the most significant number of those people would have been from working class backgrounds. Now. Um, you know, the, the number one way that it's affecting uh, kids, and when I say that, you know, I say youth, is, is the fact that they don't have a political voice. Um, no one listens to them because their voice carries no political weight. Uh, so that's why youth do need people like us to advocate on their behalf, you know? Is that making sense to you? It does make sense. There's something that I was talking to my team about earlier on today and this was a it was a, it was a big deal because we were talking about poverty in New Zealand children being left behind and then the high suicide numbers that New Zealand actually has and this is something that data that's been picked up um, by UNICEF who was looking to see who's in the rich countries were doing better as far as child poverty is concerned and child well-being as well. So I want to bring in uh, this, this point from a university student who talks about the resources that are available or not available for young people who may decide or be very much on the edge regarding is it worth living? Let's have a listen. I have lost friends to suicide. And the first question that comes to mind is, what did I miss? And suddenly, the word suicide becomes a part of my vocabulary. Some people feel they cannot approach mental health services for lack of genuine concern or stigma. It is my opinion that there is no consistency with how we approach this challenge or effectively deal with it. We must review prevention initiatives and how can we become the gatekeeper instead of the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. It is essential that we start holding service providers accountable, considering New Zealand reported 654 suicides in 2019 and currently has one of the highest suicide rates in the OECD. 
So Boris, this is this is problematic. Paul Maheno also mentions here on YouTube, white discrimination is rife in New Zealand. Odern is in denial of the critical problems facing youth suicide and well-being. You know very a lot about this, this whole area, this whole issue of young people and youth suicide. What would you say back to Paul here, who's just saying the government isn't paying enough attention? Well, uh, I, I think the, uh, the, the there's, there's so considerable amount of, of, of truth to what he's saying. Um, I, I mean, we work in that field. I say to people, what would you what would you prefer to talk about? The key to life, which is hope, or suicide prevention? You know, one of those is is hopeful, and the other one is fearful. So you know, it's, it's why we, we've named our, our charitable trust the key to life. Uh, we found that that young 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 people, particularly in schools, uh, are, are not as afraid as uh, as our generation is to talk openly about how they how they're feeling. And, and one of the greatest uh, uh, skills you can give give a, uh, a kid is uh, is a vocabulary, especially a young young boy, uh, to express how they're feeling inside. You know, for many people, uh, kids in, in New Zealand. Uh, Mike King is the first uh, flawed adult that they've ever seen talk openly about uh, his uh, his many flaws, and so until so we as as adults have the courage to to speak to our to our to our kids and to each other about the fact that our lives aren't perfect, and that all of us eventually uh, are, are going to go through life stuff, things won't change. You know. Um, mm. They will just be tinkering around the around the edges, and those people in uh, uh, in positions of power need to actually start listening to the people in the communities and divest the the control and responsibility back to the community. That's my viewpoint. I want to go back to yeah. Calvin Davis, who you remember as the Minister for Children. Brooke, I'll give you one second. Love you to come back in here. And he talks about uh, real change, that there is a lot more work to do. He references the UNICEF recommendations about what you need to do with young people to make sure that they have a healthy, safe future. Um, and Brooke, I want to bring in a letter that you wrote to uh, Jacinda Ardern and her government just after they had that landslide win. Um, I'm going to show the letter here. I want you to just briefly tell us, what did you write? Not just you, but a number of organisations all got together and you had a message to the government. What was it? Yeah, so this was an open letter um, that was signed by 70 plus organisations that are on the ground um, calling for the government to lift current um, benefit levels, which are... Um, welfare support that people receive here in New Zealand um, and low income levels to livable levels before Christmas. Um, this is because we know what the situation like is on the ground for people and families and children. Um, and we, uh, yeah, and so we put that out. There's 70 yeah. plus organizations that have supported the open letter. Um, and Jacinda Ardern said that they're not likely to look at lifting um, levels uh, this term. Um, let me just let me just let me just take in a little bit. There's a, a, a Jacinda Ardern appeared on TV New Zealand, and she hadn't even read the letter yet. But but what happened in this little clip was you can hear the number of issues she still has to contend with, and she was still seen to be on a high of her general election mm. win. Uh, let's go mm. to that clip. Let's have a listen. Let's have a look. Uh, your collective goal is also, as a government, to lift children out of poverty. There's 450 yes. organisations have penned an open letter to you this morning. Have you seen that, have you seen that open letter? Um, no. Not at this stage, right. but um, I just actually was over the weekend thinking of the organisations I need to sit down with again now that we have the fresh mandate. I'm sure they'll be amongst them. Auckland mm. City Mission, Barnardo's Child Poverty Action, Monty Cecilia, National Council of Women, CTU, Salvation Army, Save the Children. I'm sure you'll be wanting to talk to them. They're asking you to do more and, and, and specifically raise benefits. And John, I'm asking us to constantly do more as well. In fact, my message over the election was, look, 
huge progress has been made. We are still on track with our targets around child poverty. You know, we lifted a, a number out and we know the changes we make will keep us still having an effect. These, However, are tweaks, these are tweaks around the margins though, aren't they? John, an additional $100 a week on average for a sole parent looking after their family is not a tweak around the edge. It is some of the most substantive changes we've seen to benefits in decades. All, However... All of these people are saying it's not enough. I, the Welfare I, Expert Advisory Group said it's not enough. And you I, and I have had this conversation before. Now you have 50 organisations writing you And what have I said to you every time? It's not enough for me either. We were never going to fix everything in three years. My intention is to keep going and I will very, very happily continue to work with each of those organisations as I have in the last term. Lara, wow, there's such a big to-do list there. What would you suggest the government does first? Yeah, so there's a level of frustration there and I know that she, obviously Ardern will have a bit of frustration here as well. So Ardern's government, Generally, Ardern's been quite, and, and this is where she's gotten sort of a good international response in terms of her COVID response, right, has been really fairly technocratic, listening to experts, happy to bring together working groups and, and expert advisors, and had this, WIC, this Welfare Expert Advisory Group report with 47 recommendations, and they've only adopted a few of them so far. Now, in their last government, the 2017 to 2020 term, they could say, oh, well, we're in coalition with New Zealand First, we can't do this, we can't do that, you know, they, they made that excuse a lot of times. So it's now this term where they have sort of free reign obviously they've got to balance the budget to a certain extent and they've got COVID going on as well but they kind of do need to sit down and figure out where these priorities are because it's like to have an actual wealthy expert advisory group that you've brought together and for you to only adopt a few of those recommendations that's fairly damning overall. There's no shortage of advice and guidance, though, for the Adern government. Now that they have a landslide general election win, lots of people saying this is what we can do. Dave is one of them. What I'd like to see Jacinda do, and this is what I'm lobbying for at the moment, and I've already spoken to our Associate Health Minister, Penny Hinade, I'm going to start a petition and I'm going to take it to Parliament that all of these fast food chains like restaurant brands and McDonald's, all of these places that are exploiting and making millions out of the most deprived areas, they need to, just like pokies and liquor, they need to not, not tax. I'm not talking about tax that we have to pay because the problem with that is we'll pay it. And then the families miss out on more good food. Or they miss out on, on school books, uniforms, because we're gonna pay that. This is, the, this is the issue. What needs to happen is they need to put in, reinvest into the communities a portion of their profits into the community groups that are already there working to combat obesity, diabetes, depression, and everything else associated with it. So many people willing to help the government do better by people who are impoverished in New Zealand. Brooke, you're one of them. You're right up there, Auckland Action Against Poverty. I'm just looking at you on Instagram. You've invited the Prime Minister to come see your work. Has she taken you up on that invitation? Uh, no, she hasn't. Um, we've also had a response from a formal response from the open letter that we've penned, um, outlining, you know, as she as you say, she's she uses her signature, kind of smiling, and um, she seems really upbeat in delivering messages that are actually really heartbreaking. Um, uh, yeah, I just she needs to do better. They can do more. They have the mandate. They've got the power. Um, and so, I mean, the communities that we serve on the ground, they just, they don't have the luxury of time to kind of sit around and wait for politicians to get their, um, to get it sorted, mm -hmm. to figure out um, actually what we're calling for is a change in our system and a change in the values that we prioritize, what informs our public policy and our laws. We're asking, um, yeah, the government to see everybody, everybody that exists here has the right to exist and should have enough to meet their essential human needs. Housing is a human right. Um, having enough money to thrive in this country is a human right. And so um, the government have the power to do that. And so, um, yeah, we're gonna keep pushing for it and, and we will until um, we see the actual transformational change that we need um, for our babies and our future. So yeah, thank you, Femi. Thank you, Brooke.
Thank you, Boris. Thank you, Lara. Really appreciate you shining some light on social issues in New Zealand that we don't always see because we're so used to seeing a New Zealand as a shining bright light in terms of not just democracy, but also what they're doing right now in terms of controlling the COVID pandemic. So going a little bit below the surface there to dig into other issues. Thank you, guests, for being with us. Thank you, YouTube, for your excellent questions. Appreciate you. I will see you next time on the Stream Home Edition.